Does the Bible teach that babies should be baptized? We'll explore that next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with evangelist Kevin Presley. Baptism is an important subject in the New Testament. It is not a church-created ritual or ordinance. It's not a human tradition, and it is not a work of man's righteousness. It is a commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Well, when Jesus commissioned His apostles to go forth and preach the gospel, He said to make disciples in every nation. Mark's account says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. And then He says to baptize them and then to teach them to observe all of His commandments. Well, the very first time the gospel was preached by the apostles and the church was established, we read that 3,000 people in one day were baptized for the remission of their sins. The scriptures show that a number of spiritual blessings are received when one, like them, submits to Christ in baptism. So that brings up the question, who should be baptized? There are churches that claim to baptize babies. They practice sprinkling for baptism, and parents choose to have their child christened or dedicated, and some believe that even babies must be baptized, must be baptized because of what they claim is inherited Adamic sin. Well, what say of the Scriptures? We'll find out in a moment. If you've ever visited an assembly of the Church of Christ, you've seen that it's different. No rock bands, no choirs and praise teams, no theatrical productions. That's because we believe worship is simple but profound and is according to what's revealed in God's Word. When you visit with the Church of Christ, you'll find that everybody simply sings the praise of the Lord together, congregationally. We meet around the Lord's table every Sunday to remember the body and blood of the Lord and His new covenant. We pray together, and none of that pop psychology, but sound teaching from the Word of God. Oh, and one more thing, we won't ask for your money. Members provide for the needs of the local church through a weekly collection. So forget all the hype. Come see the difference and be our honored guest today. Want to see today's study again? Watch Let the Bible Speak anytime, even on the go, on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Go to letthebiblespeak.tv and also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Paul and Silas were in jail and an earthquake came at the midnight hour causing the jail doors to open and the jailer charged with keeping them was afraid that they had all escaped and he was about to take his own life. But Paul stopped him, assured him that all of the prisoners were still there and this man was amazed and his heart was softened. And I'll pick up the reading in Acts 16 beginning in verse 29. The Bible says that he called for a light and he sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. 
And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Well, who was Luke talking about when he said that all of the jailer's house was baptized? The text doesn't tell us. And so to discern the truth, we'll have to see what else the Scriptures teach about baptism's purpose and design. What is baptism? Why are people commanded to be baptized? What conditions do they have to meet to qualify as candidates for baptism? All of these are questions that are essential to settle the issue of whether babies should be baptized. So first let's look at the scriptural mode of baptism. What did it mean to be baptized in apostolic times? How were people baptized? There are many words that have crept into ecclesiastical usage today that didn't originate with the Bible. Uh, some of these words describe a practice or concept some believe might be taught in one way or another within the Scriptures, but the word itself originated with man. Well, baptism is not such a word. It's a Bible word. So we can look to the Bible and see how the word was used, and we can turn to the sources that we uh, believe are credible to help us define these words as they were used in that time in that original language. Now the Greek word baptizo was used some 80 times in the New Testament. And it is a form of the word bapto, and that root word means to dip. W. E. Vine says that the Greeks used the word in that day, baptizo, to refer to dyeing a garment or drawing water by dipping one vessel into another. Now there's a related word, baptisma. It means the process of immersion, submersion, or emergence, Vine says. Now the English transliteration is baptism. Baptisma has been transliterated by translators as baptism. So when we read, for example, of John's baptism or baptisma, it is talking about John immersing people in water. Well, that makes sense because we read where people went down to the Jordan River to be baptized at the hands of John. Now if baptism consisted of sprinkling, why the Jordan River? Sprinkling or pouring could have been accomplished anywhere. That A small container of water could be found or carried, or water could be drawn out of a well. No, it's rather obvious that John was immersing people in water. There was much water in the Jordan. Now that's in line with what the book of Acts says about baptism. In Acts chapter 8 we read of the conversion of the nobleman of Ethiopia, and the Bible says that when Philip preached Jesus to him, they were passing a body of water, and the eunuch desired to be baptized. So the Bible says in verses 38 and 39 that he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now here the word baptized is the transliteration of the Greek word baptizo, uh, which also comes from the word bapto. It means to dip, submerge, or plunge. Well we just read the eunuch's baptism involved going down into the water and coming up out of the water. Now that's how the Bible says people were baptized. Unfortunately though, tradition can change how we use certain words. When the King James translators set out to translate the Bible into English, one word that was not allowed to be translated but instead was transliterated is, or I should say to, uh, words that were not allowed to be translated but instead were transliterated are these words baptisma and baptizo. Instead, they were transliterated as baptism and baptize instead of being translated to their English equivalent, immersion or immerse. Now why would they do that? Well, because tradition had already taken hold. King James was an Anglican, and the Anglican church, like the Catholic church, practiced sprinkling and called it baptism. 
And by this time, this tradition trumped apostolic practice. Now, sprinkling did not officially begin until the year 1311, almost 1300 years after the gospel was first preached and the Lord's church was established. Now, there were isolated incidents of sprinkling a couple hundred years after Pentecost, recorded by uh, Eusebius, for example, when people were on their deathbeds, clinical baptism, as it was called. They had water poured on or around them. But again, that's according to history a few hundred years after the establishment of the church. It was not an apostolic practice. And sprinkling did not gain official acceptance in the Catholic Church until the year 1311. The apostolic practice commissioned by Christ was to immerse. And how could it have been any other way? Colossians 2 and verse 11 says, Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him to the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and through 5, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. So if you're going to baptize a baby, you would have to immerse a baby, according to Scripture, to follow the biblical mode or method of baptism. But then there are the prerequisites of baptism. What is necessary before a person can be scripturally baptized? Uh, notice Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Who were they to baptize? Those whom they had taught those whom they had made disciples of, teach and then baptize. In Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not will be condemned. Who should be baptized? Well, one who has been taught and then who has believed what he was taught. Someone says, well, why didn't Jesus say if baptism was necessary to salvation, then why wouldn't Jesus say he that believeth not and is not baptized will be condemned. He didn't say anything about baptism in the negative portion of the statement or, or the passage. Well, the reason is, is because baptism is predicated upon belief. And uh, baptism does an unbeliever no good. If a person can't or doesn't believe, baptism is not for him. So why would Jesus need to say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be condemned? Baptism is the response of belief. Who should be baptized? One who has been taught and then one who has believed what he was taught. And then there's Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter told the multitude on Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who should be baptized? All who would repent and who wanted to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then look again at the baptism of the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian nobleman in Acts chapter 8. Beginning in verse 35, the Bible says that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So first he taught him. Then the eunuch desired to be baptized. He was told he could be baptized if he believed. He then confessed with his mouth his belief in the Lord Jesus and then he was taken down into the water and was baptized. Can an infant do any of that? Infant baptism is wrong because babies don't meet the prerequisites for baptism. Friend, it is a human tradition, not an apostolic practice. 
But some will argue that children can and even should be baptized upon the faith of their parents. And they liken it to the old covenant and circumcision. And they say that since babies were circumcised under the Abrahamic covenant, that parents today can likewise exercise their faith on behalf of their children and have them sprinkled that they might be part of the covenant and the church. Uh, they say that children are uh, participants in the covenant by being passive participants. They're not active participants. They are passive participants in the covenant by virtue of their parents having them christened. But now there's a big, big difference. The old covenant was a fleshly covenant. It was a national covenant. One was part of that covenant by virtue of his being a descendant of Abraham. And so he was born into that system, into that covenant, and thus he received the sign of circumcision on the eighth day of his life. But Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 tells us that that old covenant vanished away and that we are now living under a new covenant. We now receive the blessings promised to Abraham spiritually, not by being born a child of Abraham or a fleshly Jew. There is no advantage to being uh, of a particular race. That's not how we receive the promises of Abraham, but rather as the result of the new or second birth that Jesus talked about in John chapter 3. And Paul shows us in Galatians chapter 3 that we, we Gentiles, are now heirs to the promises made to Abraham when we submit in faith to the gospel. It comes through faith. Galatians 3 verses 26 and 27 say, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then verse 29 says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So I'm baptized into Christ upon my faith in Christ Jesus, not upon the faith of my parents, Babies don't meet the prerequisites for baptism. And the new covenant is not a fleshly national covenant like the first covenant was to which circumcision pertained. And then there is the purpose of baptism. The Bible plainly, unequivocally states in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Saul was told in Acts 22 and verse 16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So why are believing penitent sinners told to be baptized? We're not baptized just merely as an outward sign. We're not baptized just simply to be dedicated to the Lord. We are baptized, the Bible says, to receive the remission of our sins through the blood of Jesus, to have our sins washed away. In order to receive the remission of sins and to call on the name of the Lord, we must be immersed. Now, babies have not committed any sin. They're born into a world of sin. They are subject to sin in this world. And they become sinners like all men when they in time, violate the law of God as all people do. For the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23. But a baby is not born with sins to his or her charge that must be remitted. The doctrine of original sin or the idea, is, uh, the idea that babies are born with Adamic or original sin was formulated by a man named uh, St. Augustine. He was a member of the Catholic Church who lived in the 4th and 5th centuries. And his ideas concerning original sin and grace were the basis for the later teachings of the Protestant Reformation under men such as John Calvin. The practice of infant baptism in many churches today is very closely linked to this doctrine of Augustine of original sin. But the New Testament simply doesn't teach such. In fact, Jesus bid the children to Him saying that of such are the kingdom of heaven and taught us to emulate them. Why would Jesus use them as such an example if they, like any adult, like any person 
of an accountable age were vile, guilty, disgusting sinners. They have no sins to wash away, my friends. And so therefore, infant baptism is not a biblical doctrine. Finally, what about all of the passages in the book of Acts that seem to speak of household baptism? The jailer and his house that we noted in Acts chapter 16, they were baptized, the Bible says. Uh, Cornelius' household was saved according to Acts 11 and verse 14. Acts chapter 16 and verse 15 speaks of Lydia and her household being baptized. And over in Acts chapter 18 and verse 8, we read where Crispus and all his house believed on the Lord. But be very careful because the text doesn't say any more than it says. Should we really surmise, make assumptions, draw conclusions from a text that would cause it to turn around and contradict what other passages plainly say about baptism? The fact is you don't know any more than I do about who made up the house of the jailer or the house of Cornelius. You might have someone who uh, comes up with some very educated sounding speculation. But the fact is they don't know who made up the households of those people. You can say, well, it's very likely that they had small or even infant children. But that's speculation at best. There is not one single word in Scripture that says that that was the case. And even if there were, the word house or household would be qualified by the definition and design of baptism. What if I were to say, like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said that over in Joshua chapter 24. What if I have children who are not old enough to understand anything about the will and worship of God? What if I had an infant child born into my family, uh, a six-month-old baby? They're not capable of choosing to serve the Lord. But I can raise them so they will serve the Lord one day. But at that point, they can't willfully and consciously serve the Lord. So does that make Joshua's statement inapplicable? Well, I would say no, because the phrase my house infers all within my house who are able to serve the Lord. Well, either way, the word house or household in the case of families converted to Christ does not validate infant baptism. In Mark 16, verse 16 again, Jesus said that the apostles were to preach the gospel to every creature, saying, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Notice it says to preach to every creature. Well, does that mean that I am to preach the gospel to an infant? Well, it says every creature. Should I go to the maternity ward and preach to the newborn babies there at the hospital? It says every creature. Oh, we would say that's silly. They can't hear and understand preaching. But are they living souls? Well, of course they are. Surely we can see that the phrase every creature is limited to those who are capable of hearing and understanding the gospel. And in the same way, one's household being baptized would be limited to those who are able to willfully submit to such out of faith and upon repentance. Baptism is a commandment of the Lord for the believing penitent sinner to have his or her sins forgiven and to enter into a new relationship with Christ Jesus, freed from sin, becoming the servant of righteousness. Now then, have you, have you chosen to be baptized for the remission of your sins or were you sprinkled as a baby? I hope we can see that such is a man-made tradition of religion that was instituted centuries after Christ Jesus gave the command of baptism and centuries after the apostles of Christ went throughout the world fulfilling the Great Commission. What you need to do is be immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins. That's in your Bible. And it is in your Bible in black and white, plain as day. And you need to do that not because someone made that decision for you, but because you have been convicted of the sins you have committed, because you have come to have faith in Christ to save you from your sins, because you have decided to turn from your sins in repentance, and because you have resolved to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And if you can be touched by the power of the gospel, if you're willing to do that, we would be so happy today to assist you, and I hope you'll let us know of your desire, and I am praying that you will do that today.
The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word, and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course? It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. We're always happy to provide you a free printed transcript of each lesson, and if you would like today's lesson, simply get in touch with us and request the lesson, Should Babies Be Baptized? And we'll get that on its way right away. Well, we appreciate you for joining us for Let the Bible Speak today. Our time is gone. Hope you'll tell someone else about the program in the days to come and make plans to join me right back here, the Lord willing, next week for another study of God's Word. Until then, may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.